This week is going to be a real test of those animal spirits. Palo Alto Network's already a bit of a fly in the ointment, lowering its forecast. NVIDIA will be yet another test tomorrow. This is the markets in the U.S. sit near all-time highs. Other signs of animal spirits come in the form of Bitcoin, now well above $50,000 per Bitcoin. And then there's gold. Why do you need defense in your portfolio when offense is working so well? Gold prices are flat. The gold mining stocks have underperformed that so far in 2024. For some perspective on gold, let's bring in David McIlvaney, CEO and Portfolio Manager at McIlvaney Financial. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, David. I kind of I wanted to set it up that way because it seems like, you know, we're tech and nothing else. And we're sort of leaving, you know, what happened if tech misses, if it's disappointing for whatever reason, where is the safety trade? Well, I'm glad you mentioned where those other markets are because it's like we've seen this movie before. The dot-com craze took valuations to very high levels and it didn't appear that you needed any defense at all. In fact, the momentum trade was the only trade in town. And then, you know, a later iteration was crypto. Now we have AI, and it's almost like a disease of the mind for investors and analysts. They can't think except in infinite terms. There are no limits, and it becomes irrational, frankly, the kinds of numbers that you, you, you can put up there. And NVIDIA is just a, a classic example. NVIDIA is, is trading at 97 times earnings, and you know, that, that's a long time to wait to see, a money, to see money actually roll back to investors. It's a speculation, it's a, it's a reflection of where we're at in a cycle. And as that cycle turns, I think you see the value of, of a hedge. So gold is underappreciated today by Western investors, and gold shares are very underappreciated by Western investors. Meanwhile, in the East and in other parts of the world, there's a cognizance of the need to own it. it it's, they're already in line. They're already getting it. In fact, there's so much of a line in Asia that you're seeing premiums paid for bullion. Yeah, 271 tons came off the Shanghai Gold Exchange yeah. last month. 320,000 ounces were bought by the government uh, to replace dollar reserves. I mean, th there is a huge demand for gold everywhere but in the West because we are enamored with the newest, shiniest, most fascinating thing, and AI happens to be it in this part of the cycle. And I mean, we should caveat that gold is by no means in the doldrums, right? It's just been hanging out at close to record levels. And, and I would say that's even more astounding given that it's coincided with a, a rally in the US dollar. Amber, you're so right, because typically traders will say, yes, but if the dollar's strong, gold must be weak. And that can be the case in the short run, but there are many instances where both can move together. And I could see a scenario where the dollar trades significantly higher on the basis of global recessionary concerns and, and sort of fracturing within the global financial markets, and so the dollar playing sort of a safe haven role. On the other hand, gold as a safe haven, it's already playing that role, and it's getting the benefit of, of you know, 1,000 tons per year, now two years in a row, from central bank buying. Why are they buying? Will that change? That, that, that's a good question. If it changes, it changes. But the reason they're buying today is they want to diversify away from U.S. dollar hegemony. They want to be out from under the thumb of Uncle Sam. And you're seeing that with Russia. You're seeing that with China. You're seeing that with India. You're seeing that with Turkey. You're seeing that with Brazil. I'll give you a list of 12 different central banks that are actively buying bullion. And it's a part of their reserve management strategy to diversify away from the dollar. That trend, I don't think, is going to change anytime soon. So really, the inflection point for gold comes when investors are interested. You see a crack in the tech trade. And now I think you're talking about uh, a significant flocking to uh, the gold market. Why? Because there's been such a concentration in just a few names. Mm -hmm. There's actually been fairly broad market weakness over the last, say, six six to 12 weeks. And and, and so looking at a broader measure of, of the markets, not just the MAG-7, not just the NDX, not just SPY, uh, you, see, you see some lackluster performance, certainly on a relative basis. Nothing's keeping up with those five to seven names. So you get one of them, just one of them, to disappoint in terms of a future outlook. And I think that's what you're seeing with, with, with Palo Alto today. Even the thought of a disappointment in the future and you realize you're way too far out over your skis. You overcommitted, and now it's time to pay.
And that is what we're seeing right now with Palo Alto, with the caveat that their conference call hasn't begun. But uh, yeah, Palo Alto is still down about 12.5%. Uh, I want to pick up on a point because your views on bullion, these miners have underperformed um, even just the, the gold price holding in. Um, what does it take to get them moving again? Yeah, well, it is really the Western investor who has to take an interest in gold. But what the Western investor doesn't realize or appreciate at this point is what a different batch of companies these are from 10 years ago. We got to $1,900, $2,000 an ounce over a decade ago, and these companies were a mess. Their balance sheets were awful. They were making acquisitions that were not justifiable. They held their reserves at ridiculously high numbers. And as bullion, as the price came off, they had to write off a lot of those reserves, take them out of their mine plants. Now it's the exact opposite. You've got most of your big producers are carrying their reserves at $1,200 an ounce. I mean, even if we had a $150 correction in the price of gold, mm -hmm. they're not threatened by that. But keep in mind, you see $150 move the other way, and now they're bringing millions of ounces into their mine plan, and their net asset value goes through the roof. But today, instead, you've got ridiculous numbers. Newmont trading at a 72% discount to its net asset value. Agnico Eagle trading at a 46% discount to its net asset value. B2 Gold, an 81% discount to its net asset value. Mag Silver, 63% discount to net asset value. Pan American, 79% discount. Even a company like Franco Nevada, if you strip out Cobra Panama completely, give them no value at all for that, it's trading at a 10% discount. Hmm. I mean, this is a bellwether for the space and it's trading at a discount. I can't remember the last time I saw Franco trade at a 10% discount. It's an asset class that has been neglected and nobody's paying attention to the fact that they have healthy margins, healthy balance sheets, and any any incremental move higher, it's not just current production that's included in NAV and, and, and current resources that are included in NAV. There's a bunch of other assets which they get to bring into the, their NAV calculations. So I think you can see prices radically higher off of very low levels and you're talking about gold trading at near all-time highs and yet these are trading as if gold is five six hundred dollars cheaper it's amber in my book it's patently absurd